Welcome to the World Shapers, conversations with authors about their latest books. I'm your host, Edward Willett, and this episode's guest, Matthew Hughes. We'll be talking about Matthew's latest book, A God in Hiding, and his recent young adult adventure story, The Amir's Falcon. Hello, and welcome to episode 155, I believe that's right, yes, of The World Shapers. This is uh, the podcast where I talk to other uh, authors about their latest books. I am myself an author of many, many different sorts of books. I'm primarily a science fiction, and well, I think of myself as primarily a science fiction and fantasy author, although I've written a ton of nonfiction as well and some other things. Uh, my latest novel was uh, The Tangled Stars, which came out from Daw Books back uh, late in uh, 2022. I'm currently working on something else, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm an, an author as well as a podcaster and a publisher. Uh, my publishing company is uh, Shadowpaw Press. Shadowpawpress.com is the website. And Shadowpaw Press has uh, three new titles. I don't personally have a title out right now, but I have three new titles that I've published through Shadowpaw Press very recently. Uh, the first is The Good Soldier. I interviewed the author, Anir Yaniv, uh, a couple of episodes ago. He is uh, the author of what is uh, best described as MASH meets Starship Troopers or MASH in Outer Space. Depends on how you want to look at it. Uh, it's a military sci-fi satire. Very funny. Uh, I highly suggest you check that one out. Uh, also out is... a uh, just this week, in fact, is The Headmasters, which is a young adult dystopian science fiction novel from Canadian author Mark Morton. It is actually set in Northern Ontario, and I highly recommend that one as well. It has a rave review from Robert J. Sawyer, whose book, The Downloaded, I'll be publishing in May, the print version of it. It's out right now as an Audible uh, original, uh, but I'll, I'll have the print version out in May alongside uh, two uh, new novels by the late great author Dave Duncan. But that's in May. The other one that's come out just in the last couple of weeks is a Shapers of Worlds Volume 4. Shapers of Worlds is a anthology series, an anthology series, which I began in uh, 2020 with a Kickstarter in March 2020 when nothing else was going on. And it features authors who have been guests on this podcast, science fiction and fantasy authors. Uh, all of my authors up until recently were science fiction and fantasy, but going forward, there will be some authors in other genres as well. Uh, so please check that one out, Shapers of Worlds Volume 4. It has some great authors in it. The lead story is by international best-selling author Sherry Lynn Kenyon. Uh, Michael Brent Collings is in there. David Boop. Uh, uh, just a, a great... Oh, Lavi Tidhar has a story in there, a reprint. Uh, just a great collection of authors and stories. And it's all illustrated by uh, Wendy Nordell, a Calgary artist uh, who happens to be my niece. So do check that one out as well. All Shadow Pop Press books are available widely. Uh, if you search for them on pretty much any bookstore site, you will find them and you can get them in through your local bookstores and sometimes they will be in your local bookstores. So <laughs> please check all that out. All right. Well, let's get on to this episode's guest where I will be talking to Matthew Hughes. Uh, Matthew Hughes writes fantasy, space opera, and crime fiction. He sold 24 novels, well, probably more than that now. This, uh, this bio, I think, is a couple of years old, to publishers large and small in the UK, US, and Canada, as well as nearly 100 works of short fiction to professional markets. His latest novels include A God in Chains, uh, Dying Earth Fantasy from Edge Publishing, What the World, What the Wind Brings, sorry, Magical Realism Historical Novel from Pulp Literature Press, and of course, the book we'll be talking about, A God in Hiding, uh, today. He's also the author of The Amir's Falcon, which is a young adult. Um, um, it, it's not science fiction or fantasy. It's basically a contemporary YA adventure story, outdoor adventure story set in the Swan Hills of Alberta, which was published by my own Shadowpaw Press. So we're going to talk about that one and A God in Hiding on this podcast. Uh, Matt has won the Endeavor and Arthur Ellis Awards, has been shortlisted for the Aurora, Nebula, Philip K. Dick, Endeavor, A.E. Van Vogt, Net Neffy, and Derringer Awards. He's been inducted into the Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Association's Hall of Fame, and he's my guest. So let's talk to Matt. So, uh, Matt, welcome back to the World Shapers. Oh, I, I keep forgetting to do this. I should take off my reading glasses so my eyes aren't all sparkly. <laughs> we all did the same. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to see my face that clearly anyway. <laughs> so this is the second time I've had you on the podcast. Uh, of course, you were on the original audio 
uh, only version, which was focused very much on creative process. Uh, but now I'm focusing on uh, new releases, which is why I'm starting to have people back for a second time. And uh, two books we want to talk about today. One is uh, A God in Hiding, which came out in December. And then I also, of course, want to mention uh, The Amir's Falcon, which was published by a uh, publishing company that's very near and dear to my heart, Shadowpaw Press. <laughs> we'll talk about both of those. Uh, but first, I suppose, um, let's start with a, a, a God in Hiding. And how does it, it's it's in a series that you've written a number of books in. Uh, so maybe tell us a little bit about the book and the, the world in which it is set. Okay, start with the world. Um, way back about the time I was being born, Jack Vance, a brilliant grandmaster of science fiction and fantasy, uh, created a milieu or well, yeah, I'm going to say he created it. A book called The Dying Earth, and it's old Earth, our planet, set way off in the future, maybe millions of years. Um, very vague and, and indeterminate. But uh, more or less civilization, science, technology have all collapsed. Magic has come back. And although Vance was wonderful at sketching and never defined things too closely, but I see it as like Renaissance Italy with magic, with wizards. Uh, so I call it a, a world of wizards of all cities. And he wrote uh, a number of novels afterwards set in that milieu, and I was always entranced by it. So when, uh, oh, go. Okay. George R. R. Martin and Gardner Dozois asked me to write a story, 10,000 words, for their anthology, Rogues, which was a bestseller, by the way. Um, I thought, I'll create a nasty thief type character and set him in Vance's dying earth without making it too explicit. And so I wrote the story, I sold it to them, they liked it. And then I thought, well, I could do more with this character. I sort of caught him at the end of his career. The character's name was Raffalon, by the way, Raffalon the Thief. Um, so I started way back and started writing stories, and I sold them all to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And eventually I put them in a collection and self-published them. But before I'd finished doing that, I was thinking about other characters and, and other things I could do in the dying earth. And so I kept on doing them. And I created another fellow who was a wizard's henchman called Baldemar. And he went on for another nine episodes. He started out also in a, a gardener and uh, um, George anthology. And I just kept writing this stuff because I, I really liked it. What I found I was doing was exploring that universe, that milieu, from the points of view of different characters. Um, and often, as it's common with just about everything I do, not major characters, but henchmen and thieves and, you know, kind of people who get a walk on in a, in a play and then they say their lines and then they're gone. But they're not, you know, world-shaking change makers. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they have, they have their lives, and their lives are meaningful to them. They get involved in conflicts and struggles. You can make stories out of that. Now, A God in Hiding is the latest in that. It's a kind of sequel to a, a book I had out in 2019, I think, called A God in Chains. And it's set in the dying earth. And in A God in Chains, there was a minor character by the name of Raider. She didn't even have a first name in the the first book, uh, who was the first mate on a riverboat, and who, because of the malfeasance of the villain and so on, uh, became the captain of that riverboat, and then was heard no more because the story moved on. But then when I thought about doing another one, I thought, okay, well, let's take Raider and get her in the situations where she's dealing with magic and, and conspiracies, big stuff, and she's a, a struggling pawn trying to uh, get to the end of the board, become a queen, that kind of thing. Um, and so I sat down and I, I wrote it. And in this case, because I had moved from where I was, that I would write stories in a series, sell them to a magazine, 
and then published them as an episodic novel after. Uh, I said, no, I'll just write the damn thing and self-publish it. So that's what I did. And it came out uh, December 8th. Uh, there was a horrific mistake I'd made of, of, of uploading a PDF instead of an EPUB to Amazon. So it was full of glitches, but I managed to get that fixed and, and so on in a day or two. Um, and now it's selling quite well, you know, for what I consider to be a good thing. I, I'm selling a few copies. <coughs> Excuse me. Selling a few copies every day and starting to get reviews and, and people seem to be happy with it. Now, you you mentioned this all began, of course, with Jack Vance and you're a, a huge <coughs> fan of Jack mm -hmm. Vance. What is it about his writing and this world in particular that drew you to it? Why do you think it appeals to you so much? Uh, well, I've said this before and it's actually quite true. I like to write about henchmen because I spent most of my life as a henchman. I was a speechwriter to uh, powerful people, you know, leaders of governments and political parties and CEOs of billion dollar corporations. Uh, and I was That's a kind of wizard for hire. <laughs> yeah, well, a, a henchman, yeah. Not a wizard. Um, more like uh, a chamberlain or under, cha under chamberlain. You know, I did a specific job. I did it very well. I used to make very good money as a speechwriter. And I was considered the actual best in British Columbia. And I can prove that because we have always had the most uh, polarized politics in, in this province. If you work for one party, the others will touch you. But I've actually written the winning leadership convention speech people who became leaders of all three political parties, in Paul Sobrey, the NDP, and the Liberals. And I suppose if the Conservatives had ever got their act together, I would have written for one of them too. But uh, that's a unique accomplishment, if you call it, or you know, certainly a unique characteristic of me. Uh, is that it, it didn't matter what the politics were, they wanted somebody who could write a speech that would turn a convention. And I was that guy. Well, that that's explains why you like to write about henchmen, but what what attracts you to the world itself, the kind of far oh, future? Oh, oh, yes, yes, because it's a world of antiheroes, and I have always liked antiheroes. Uh, I think it goes back to reading Catch-22 back in 1965, um, and I have just had a, a, a resonance with uh, you know the, the kind of person who is neither terribly moral nor amoral, in all, uh, but who has a story to tell and, and a, a struggle to to make. Uh, so the dying earth is, there are no good people in it really at all. Uh, I mean, there, there are, I think Vance had one hero in, in one of the stories who was kind of a good guy, but otherwise, you know, he's, uh, they're all people who have their agendas and many of them are just absolutely selfish about it. And they contend against each other. They rarely cooperate with each other. And that's, it creates, it creates a mood. And that's the thing I find most gratifying, most uh, drawing in of Vance's stories. Is there is a mood that just resonates perfectly with me. So that's what I write. Do you think that your writing style is very Vancean? Or what sets you apart from the way that he told stories like this? Well, a number of things. I I do use his style of description, except when it comes to colors. There were always, you know, two parent descriptions of sunsets in Vance, and I don't do those because I have limited color vision, so there's no point trying to describe what's in you know, the layers of a sunset. Um, but he was a sketcher, so he would... Uh, Pick a, a couple of three very pertinent and important, they have to be pertinent, details about a scene, setting. And that was it. It would leave the reader to confabulate all the rest of it, which people do. Um, so I, I have that. But uh, I do some of the kind of uh, fake Edwardian dialogue and sometimes 
prose descriptions. Because I think, uh, well, I know that Vance was very much influenced by P.G. Woodhouse, who is also a favorite of mine. Um, and he had that ring of old-fashioned prose in addition to the neologisms that he would routinely create. So yes to that, to me, that, you know, the sketching and the, uh, the high-flown verbiage. But the rest of it, no. Um, I think anybody who reads a couple of paragraphs of mine and a couple of paragraphs of Vance will say, no, they're not really the same. I'm certainly not trying to copy him. I'm not trying to write pastiche. I, uh, I admit I'm playing in his sandbox, but I'm not building the same kind of sandcastles that he did. <laughs> Good metaphor. Now, um, we talked about process when I talked to you before, but just to reiterate, how do you go about beginning a story? Um, do you do detailed outlines or do you no. just start writing and see what happens? I start writing and see what happens. Um, do you have a character in a setting and that's kind of the beginning? A character in a setting and then I do something that makes the character have a problem and then I see how the character responds to it. And as we move forward, other characters come in and there is you know, going to be conflict and coherence. And all of that generates story. And somewhere around a third to a half of the way through, uh, it sort of gels in the back of my head as to what this story is about. And then I push on through to the end. Right now I'm writing uh, a book which is, the working title is The Guan, and it's a sequel to a completion, really, of a, of a novel I had out in 2010 called The Other. And it's set in the Bansian style uh, pre-Dime Earth uh, universe, the space opera universe, where there's this galactic civilization uh, strung down along the, the galactic arm, the 10,000 worlds, it's called. Um, and I originally, when I wrote The Other, I was going to write a sequel, and the publisher who took it uh, took the first one, wanted the sequel, but then she got uh, fed up with the business. She just started publishing the company, and she sold it all to another publisher, a bigger publisher, who wasn't interested in the sequel. So I just put it on a, a shelf. Now I'm, I'm back to doing it. I've got 43,000 words written, and I've very recently come to understand who the villain is which is very important. The villain has been murky and in the back shadows somewhere and nobody knows. They're all trying to figure out. Uh, but now it's, it's the direction to the end of it has been kind of clear. I'm going to probably finish it over the next month or so. Um, and then, fingers crossed, uh, <clears throat> if I've got a Canada Council grant or a BC Arts Council grant or a deal somewhere in uh, with a big publisher in the States, I'm going to pick up uh, a historical novel that I originally thought about writing back when I was 16. <clears throat> it's about a, Alexander the Great, just before he died, sent a ship westward through the Mediterranean. Uh, and the job was to circumnavigate Africa and come back and get reports so that he could conquer it. And then the ship went off and then Alexander died and their oldest generals began fighting each other for the empire. And nobody knows what happened to that ship. <laughs> Quite likely they were uh, seized by the Carthaginians and uh, enslaved or whatever. But I'm going to find out. Well, you're. You're quite prolific. You have a lot of different worlds you've written in, plus the historical. And how do you decide what the next thing is that you want to do? I don't really. It just pops into my head and off I go. I, I, I get arguments sometimes on writing sites from people who outline everything you know, from breakfast on. Um, I'm a purely intuitive writer. I have no training at all. I just started to write when I was young and I made a living at it. Um, and I rely upon my uh, <clears throat> my unconscious or subconscious, whatever, to feed me stuff. <laughs> See the hush. <laughs> I've got a little old labradoodle here. Who's, Just had to get a word in edgewise there. Well, she, she wakes up from a dream of ours. 
Oh. <laughs> well, I also wanted to talk, going back a little ways, um, to the, really it's a novella, but published as a standalone book, um, The Amir's Falcon, which uh, you, came to me at Shadow Paw Press. And that's quite different from the Vancey and stuff and even the historical novels. So what was the story behind, well, first of all, what is the story and, and how did that one come about? Okay, well, I'll tell you how it came about because then it leads into what the story is. Um, in the middle of the 1970s, I was speechwriter for the Federal Minister of Environment, Len Marchand, now passed away in a great dimness. Um, and one of the uh, departments underneath or services underneath the Environment Department was the Canadian Wildlife Service. And they had a facility in Wainwright on a military base uh, where they were rearing, breeding and rearing peregrine falcons to release them into the wild so that they could uh, be reestablished after the damage that DDT did to them, which almost wiped them out. Um, and Along came uh, a word from PMO, the Prime Minister's office, that uh, in order to help Canada sell a can-do nuclear reactor to a Arab state, uh, somewhere in the Gulf, an alien of some kind, um, they wanted to give a couple of the Falcons to the Emir as a diplomatic gift. And we were making sure that that happened because we had the Falcons. So that, you know, but all in train and then was undergoing whatever. Um, I didn't have much to do except to write a press release. But I got background on the facility, and what I heard was that a lot of the actual handling of the birds was by teenage volunteers. And I wondered to myself then, we're talking 1977, um, how would I react if I was a teenage kid? raising this bird to be set free. And now I find out it's going to be given to an emir to put in the cage and you know, take it out on strings to, to go and hunt whatever they hunt with falcons in, in the Persian Gulf. And I put that in the back of my head and there it remained for a very, very long time, uh, like 40 years or so. Um, I'm getting, getting closer to 50, isn't it? Good God. Anyway, um, it was always there, and one day I thought, I should write that. That would be a cool little YA story. And so I did. I sat down and I, <clears throat> I wrote it. It was just under 40,000 words. And I created three characters. One is the, the boy who uh, looks after the bird and then steals it when he hears that it's going to be given away. And then uh, the other is the son of the Emir who happens to be in Calgary studying petroleum engineering so he can be useful in his later life. And then a teenage Métis girl living up in the Swan Hills, which I knew about because I lived with two Métis families up there as a company of young Canadians volunteer in the 60s. And uh, I also fought a forest fire in, in the Swan Hills, so I knew the terrain. Um, and so I, I put it together. And of course, it, it's it's a good story, but that facility at Wainwright who were rearing the Falcons, that was closed in the 1980s. It was such a success that they did reestablish the species. Uh, I remember 20 years or so ago in waiting for a bus in uh, South Vancouver, just next to Oak Park, and I looked over the fence, and there was a falcon chewing up a pigeon in Oak Park. And when I looked at it, it looked at me, and then it said no just took the pigeon and flew away. <coughs> um, so that really, that, that program really worked. So in a way, it's an alternate history because in your book, the facility continues to operate. Yeah, it, it, well, it's kind of timeless. Um, that, that story could be said in the 70s or it could be said now, except I think, well, they have cell phones. So, but in the 70s, there were people who had phones. Hang on, I've got to turn off my email. Somehow, go away. Speaking of cell phones and all that kind of thing. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Back to that. Um, 
you mentioned the characters that you created for this. And of course, there's a ton of characters in every book and every story. And you've created a lot of memorable characters. What? How do you go about creating characters? What? Uh, what? How, do they no just step in your mind and say, hi, they, I'm they, here? <laughs> they grow. They grow yeah. within me. It's an organic process that I have no real control over. Um, in fact, when I get to a point in the story where I'm not quite sure what is going to happen next, uh, very often I will uh, take a nap or take a shower or go for a long drive, having first asked characters, what now? And at some point, uh, it just, I will just know what the answer is. It sounds like a voice speaks to me from the beyond, but I just know. Uh, it comes from the back of my head, and there it is. And then I go on writing. Well, the Amir's Falcon was um, shortlisted for a Crime Writers Award for yeah. best. That was for best novella, I think, crime novella. Well, he, he did steal the Falcon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also for a High Plains uh, Award in the young adult category, I believe. Yeah. So it had some really good uh, reaction. Um, and General, how important is that to you? You've been nominated for awards, and you're well, you're a lifetime member of. Uh, uh, you're a member of the Hall of Fame, Canadian Science Fiction Fantasy Hall of Fame. I'm actually, uh, I've won a couple. Um, yeah. my, historical novel, you? <laughs> my historical novel, What the Wind Brings, uh, was the first and so far, I think, only Canadian title to win the Endeavor Award, which is open to Canadian and uh, American authors of speculative fiction, as they call it, uh, in what generally is called Cascadia. Oregon, California, Northern yeah. California, Washington, D.C., Alberta, Idaho. I don't know. Um, as you go east, it sort of peters out, I guess. Um, but no, it won that, which I was really quite proud of because I'm actually quite proud of the book. It's the best thing I've done. Um, it's the one I want to be remembered for, as I say. I also, way back when, won the best story of the year from the Crime Writers of Canada. So, so what does that recognition mean to you when you get that, those kinds of nominations and awards? Well, it's, I'll tell you, one of those awards, and maybe five bucks, you can get a burger at uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it's nice. It's nice. Yeah, but it doesn't, actually, uh, it doesn't actually do anything for me in, in terms of career. What about uh, reader reaction? How... I can go to librarians and say, hey, I'm an award-winning author. Would you like me to come and talk to you folks? Yeah, yeah once you won an award, you can always say you're an award-winning author. So. <laughs> Twice, yeah. Um, what about reader reaction? How, how important it is to you uh, to get feedback from readers and, and hear very, that they very, like what you're doing? Very, 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 very important. Um, I remember reading something many years ago. I think it was Jimmy Stewart, the actor, was approached by some fan who gushed at him. And the fan said something like, I guess you get this all the time. It's no big deal for you, is it? And Jimmy Stewart said, it's everything to me. And, and it is to me. I, uh, I get emails from uh, readers and fans, and I respond to them every time because uh, it's a wonderful thing to know that Somebody out there is reading you and being maybe touched or at least entertained and amused. Um, it, it's it's far more important in its own way than the money. The money is not that much anyway. <laughs> Selling to small presses and, and self-publishing on Amazon. Um, but having people, uh, as I do, I, mean, I, I have right now my mailing list is just past 800 people for my monthly newsletter. Um, and that's, uh, many of them have been with me for, I don't know, forever. I've got, I've got fans that go right back to 2001 when I had my first uh, fantasy novel out. Um, and I have, uh, I suppose, some relationships with them because I hear from them, if not frequently, at least regularly. And we go back and forth and talk about this and that. And Would it, you still write if you didn't get any kind of feedback? Oh, I suppose, yeah, I suppose. I mean, well, in the beginning, I didn't get much, but I kept on writing. 
So yeah, I would. It's the only thing I'm really, really good at. It, it all. I mean, I can play the piano a little, but not really professionally. Um, so, why do you do it? Why do you Why do you tell stories? I like to. It's you know, it's it's what I do. Um, they're gonna stories are gonna occur to me anyway, so I might as well write them down. <laughs> We, you mentioned what you're working on and what you what you hope to work on. Do you have other plans even further out in the future of things you'd like to get back to, some of the worlds or something new? Uh, I don't think very far ahead because um, I am you know, uh, enslaved to the back of my head and that's where the, the ideas and the work and so on are going to come from. I can think of a, a couple of uh, a crime novel that I really thought was good, but got bobbled by my UK uh, publisher. Um, I wouldn't. I, I, at one point, I started uh, a sequel to that um, just before the the pandemic struck. It was, and that discombobulated everything. But I wrote twenty thousand words. But, but of course, now I would have to change the whole direction because then pandemic happened so that would have affected the characters were new york based so you know it was an absolute massacre there have I, you, I might go back to that one have you always uh, switched back and forth between genres like you write mystery and you write historical and you write um i i, I suppose I, I don't consciously say i'll do this and then I'll do one of them i'll do one of these one of those um i just do whatever occurs to me uh, do you have a favorite genre? Hmm? Do you have a favorite genre out of the ones you write? Or are they well, all? Yeah, I, I consider myself essentially a crime writer. Um, and I started out to be a crime writer, and I, and I won an award, and I got a novel published. And then a fantasy novel I'd written years before that hadn't gone anywhere. Suddenly, I found an opportunity to send up to one of the big houses to time one of the books, and I did. And they said, "Okay, uh, do a sequel." I, I did that too. Uh, it was a couple of books called Fool's Errand and Fool Me Twice, which came out all full of uh, lightweight, ironic humor, just in time for 9/11, which kind of changed the mood in America. <clears throat> um, so they didn't want a third book. But then uh, Dave Hartwell, the editor at Tor, who had a thing for Canadians, uh, he said, well, I'd like one, why don't you write one for me? So I wrote another one for him, Black Brilliant, it was called. Um, and about then I ran into Nightshade Books. <laughs> hush, child, hush. I ran into Nightshade Books and they asked me if I had enough stories to make a collection, I said, sure. And then they said, how about some novels? And I wrote three Hengus Hapthorne novels set, you know, just before the Die Hard. And then I was a fantasy writer, or science fiction and fantasy writer. And my hopes and dreams of uh, doing crime writing just kind of fell by the wayside. Um, but I do write crime stories set in science fiction and fantasy milieus, which is why uh, the one I'm working on right now, the sequel to the 2010 novel, is about uh, a far future space opera, master criminal, a thief, forger, go between when other people are stealing and buying, uh, by the name of Luff Embry, who is probably my favorite character. And I based him on the characters that Sidney Greenstreet played in the Maltese Falcon and Casablanca. Called the Fat Man, this big, enormous gourmet uh, fellow, you know, quite rotund and yet quite quick on his feet when he has to be. Um, so yeah, so I forget what the question was originally, but I'm doing crime as best I can, uh, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting it in here and there. I have a natural affinity for it because. Uh, I actually come from a, I won't say a family of minor criminals, but a family in which minor criminality is not unheard of. So. 
I'm the white sheep in my family. I had some great uncles who were involved with organized crime in Kansas City, apparently, but I don't know much about them and they're <laughs> written in that milieu. <laughs> well, um, where can people keep up with you and what you're doing online? Uh, well, my webpage is dormant because of some sort of glitch that happened in uh, Washington, Colorado. A server somewhere along the way. And the guy who used to run my webpage for me had just sort of disappeared out of the horizon. Uh, and it was going to cost me thousands to get it fixed, and I don't really have that kind of money. So uh, you can't go to my webpage anymore and find me. I am on Facebook. Uh, I have a personal page and also a, an author page, which pretty much has the same uh, content. I post everything both. Um, I used to be on Twitter, but uh, after recent developments, I've just quit my Twitter cam uh, account. Um, so Facebook is where to look for me. Um, and you have this newsletter, people? can the, How do they sign up for that? Uh, that's tricky because the, uh, it used to be you go to my webpage. Yeah. <laughs> I think... The best thing to do is to uh, send me an email. It's himself at arcanate.com, and I'll put you on the list. Okay, and I'll put that link on uh, the web page for this episode when it goes live. Please do, yes. Well, thanks, uh, Matt. It was uh, great to talk to you again, and uh, it was great to publish The Emir's Falcon and uh, to see it, you know, pick up those award nominations. And people that I've talked to who have read it really i really liked it, and I liked it, so there you go. Oh, just from uh, school curricula? It'd be nice if it got picked up as you know part of Alberta's high school uh, curriculum. Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks uh, for chatting with me, and uh, best of luck with uh, A God in Hiding and all the stuff that's coming up. All right, thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. And uh, thanks again to Matt for that uh, great conversation. I always enjoy talking to him, and I hope you enjoyed listening to us talk to each other. Just a few uh, closing things to remind you of. Uh, first of all, that you can find me personally at edwardwillett.com. You can find me on X, Twitter, at ewillett, two Ts on Willett. You can find me on Instagram at Edward. Willett author. You can find me on Facebook at edward.willett. And you can find me right, you're probably watching this on YouTube, right here on YouTube at Edward Willett. And please, if you are watching this on YouTube, subscribe. You won't miss another episode of The World Shapers. And you will also get to walk with me around Regina in my popular Walking in Regina series of uh, live stream videos, where I talk about publishing and writing and other stuff as well as, I, as I'm walking around. So it's kind of a, a vlog as well. My publishing company, as I mentioned off the top, is Shadow Pop Press. You can find that at shadowpoppress.com. And unlike me, it has the same handle on everything. So you can find it on x slash Twitter at Shadow Pop Press, Facebook at Shadow Pop Press, and Instagram at Shadow Pop Press. And of course, this podcast has its own website as well. It's theworldshapers.com. You can find all past episodes there, all the audio only ones. And, and these video ones also have an audio only version as well. Uh, so every episode has its own little web page with uh, contact information for the authors and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's also on uh, X slash Twitter at uh, The World Shapers and on Facebook at The World Shapers. So thank you for uh, joining me. I hope you enjoyed that chat. And I've got lots more great authors lined up. I'm currently keeping to my rather aggressive hope of uh, doing one a week. Uh, so please do subscribe if you haven't. And uh, come back and, and listen to more great conversations with authors about their latest work. That's it for this time. Bye for now.